All right, so how many first-timers do we have here again? Wow, that's a good percentage. Excellent. How'd you hear about the concert or the conference? It's a concert. You know, I'm, I'm an entertainer, if you will. Uh, no, I can't. Believe me, you don't want me to sing. No, seriously. No, wait. Well, basically, welcome to Cincinnati. Um, glad that you could uh, make it here. And my name is Jay Hayek. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist at the University of Illinois. I've been in my role at the university for nine years now. Prior to that, I was an IDNR forester with the state of Illinois, uh, based in East Central Illinois. So, Tree ID is one of my passions. It was probably my favorite course as an undergraduate student. And it's a, it's a 15, 16 week course, and it's dendrology. You know, it's the study of trees and their habitats. So obviously with 50 minutes, you know, give or take for a Q and A, it's, it's a lot of material. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on bark and buds. Um, oh jeez, this came up again. I'm sorry guys. No, just close. All right. I'm tech savvy, but some of this stuff is a little bit over my head. All right, so this is what we're going to cover today. Basically, we're going to go over some essential terminology, some basic terms that you need to understand. Otherwise, you know, learning trees, learning to identify them, looking in tree ID books, it becomes a fool's errand if you don't understand some of the basic terminology associated with tree identification. But we're going to make it a little easy. We're only going to talk about the terminology based on bark and based on buds. We're also going to talk about twigs as well, okay? Because where are the buds located? You know, on the lateral side, the terminal side of a twig. Uh, principal ID techniques, we're going to go through all of them. But again, our focus is going to be on bark and buds, all right? Uh, then I'm going to recommend some winter tree guides. There are some really outstanding winter tree guides out there, and they're very, very affordable, okay? All right, you got, and then we'll wrap it up. So hopefully I get through all my slides. Like I tell everybody, I basically have about a four hour presentation for you, and I have about 50 minutes, but I probably only have about 40 minutes now, because we've already wasted a few, but anyway. So let's jump on in. All right, so as a reminder, this is not intended to be exhaustive, all right? We're not gonna be able to cover everything, all right? This is really gonna be a superficial talk and hopefully some of the photos will help steer you in the right direction. And I already mentioned this, I mean, dendrology, the study of trees, is typically a one or two semester course at most universities. So that's 15 to 30 weeks of, of schooling to learn a lot about tree ID, all right? So with plant classification, we utilize something called the binomial system. Basically, you have a genus and a species, or a specific epithet. So for oak, for example, is the genus name, or the generic name, is called Quercus. The specific epithet, or the species name, uh, for the state tree of Illinois is Alba, Alba being white. So the genus name, or the generic name, is always capitalized, and the specific epithet is not capitalized. But they're always italicized, okay? like we have here, Italiox alba, Quercus. You put them together, you have Quercus alba. So that is the, the species together, it is the species name. So basically you're saying it's oak, and then you're identifying it even further. It's white oak, specifically. So what you'll find out in a lot of tree ID books is that there's sometimes a variety of common names, all right? Some species will have four common names, depending on your location. An example up here might be hills oak. In Illinois, we typically call it northern pin oak. So you have two common names, but if you know the genus and the species, and say Quercus ellipsoidalis, then everyone knows what you're talking about. And you sound really, really cool if you know how to Latinate, Latinize a lot of these terms. So it's not technically Latin, because a lot of these names have Greek origins or English origins, but what we do is we try to Latinize 
them. So, you know, it's just one of those stickler things. A lot of times it's technically not Latin, but we try to Latinize the names to make it sound really cool. In this case, again, this is the, the preferred common name for Quercus alba, which is the state tree of Illinois. All right, so principal ID techniques. A lot of times how we identify trees by leaves, right? Who here identifies trees by leaves? I know I do. Can you do that this, at this time of year? Well, sometimes on the ground, sometimes the oaks, right? Yeah, especially the juvenile oaks because they'll maintain a lot of their foliage on the tree. That's uh, one of the mechanisms oaks uh, utilize. It's called mar marquescence or marcescence. And they believe that the theory behind that, why some of the juvenile oak trees, is to reduce browsing. It helps protect the buds from browsing animals. So that's why sometimes juvenile oak trees and uh, ironwood and beech, so a lot of times the young trees will retain their foliage. And that's a mechanism they've adapted over the years to help prevent browsing. Flowers, uh, especially with Crataegus, the hawthorn species, some of these hawthorn species, they don't even have common names. That's how many native hawthorns we have. And we are only able to identify them by flower. All right, so I'm not sure if there's any rose or Crataegus experts out in the audience. I am definitely not. So when I see a hawthorn, I just call it hawthorn. All right, it's typically you got thorns on it, stab you in the face if you close your eyes too long. Uh, we're going to talk about bark. The great thing about bark is that you're able to identify, identify trees all year round, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what time of year it is. By looking at the bark, it will certainly help you identify a tree, at least to the genus level. Okay, if you can get to the genus level, I mean, you're doing well. You're doing well, okay? Twigs are available year-round. A lot of times we don't have the, the winter bud yet, um, especially in, you know, in, in April, May, June, where that bud has basically, you know, it's broken dormancy, so you don't have a bud to identify. You have these small, you know, elongating leaves. So sometimes you don't have access to the buds, but at least you have other things like bark. Uh, twigs, you're always going to have the twigs. You're going to be able to look at leaf arrangement. So you'll be able to look at old leaf scars to be able to t determine if it's an alternate plant, if it's an opposite plant. And we're going to talk about those terms to learn how to identify trees based on their leaf arrangement, whether it's opposite, whether it's alternate, or world. Some species, we actually have to cut into the twig with our knife and examine the pith. And the pith is just a bunch of parenchymus, parenchymus cells, and we're able to identify some of these trickier species that's one really easy way to differentiate persimmon from black gum, is to be able to look at the pith of the twigs. So I'll give you some tips and pointers that I've accumulated over the years, because when I go out in the woods, I mean, I identify 95% of my trees by bark only. But I've been doing this a long time, so it's not my first rodeo. Fruit, I mean, having fruit's awesome for tree ID, right? You know, being able to see an acorn, Okay, at least I know that's an oak. So, but what happens if your tree is only, you know, eight years old, 10 years old, and it's not producing fruit yet? Well, you don't have access to that. And just because you have acorns underneath a tree doesn't mean that tree is an oak, right? I mean, gravity moves acorns, wildlife moves acorns. So you kind of have to think outside the box sometimes on, hey, is this really the tree I'm trying to identify? Is that fruit associated with that tree? And then form is another way that we can, uh, we can identify trees, like pin oak and white pine. White pine has a really horizontal limb structure, so that really helps you identify white pine from afar. A lot of times you don't even have to be up close to white pine. You can just tell by its silhouette, you know, to be able to ID that species and know that, hey, that's eastern white pine just by its silhouette. All right, so again, we're going to focus on bark twigs, and we're not going to uh, focus on fruit, but fruit's a great way for winter tree ID as well. All right, and when I have this slide, you're supposed to laugh and say, huh, you know, all bark, no bite. Okay, we're going to talk about bark. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So bark appearance, being able to identify trees by bark appearance. I mean, seriously, as I mentioned my little note down here, um, you know, over 90% of my trees that I identify, I identify by bark and bark only. Now, there are some species that are really difficult to identify by bark. And especially when you have juvenile trees, middle-aged trees, 
and then older, more mature trees, because we're going to talk about the difference in bark morphology, and that changes as the tree matures and ages. And the bark can change based on a tree's growth rate. So there's a lot of different things to account for when you try to identify trees by bark. And it's just what I tell people is it's you have to build this mental library, this visual library of your trees. Take photos. And when I'm out, you know, taking my undergrads out in the woods, you know, take out your cell phone. Just take as many photos as you can to just keep on memorizing those trees just by the visual, okay? So we're going to talk about mature versus young trees with regard to bark. We're going to talk about bark thickness. Some trees have really thin bark, paper birch, for instance. And then some trees, based on their maturity level, have very thick bark. Think like a really old bur oak, you know, Quercus macrocarpa, right? A tree has really thick bark. It gives it a lot of fire tolerance. Not fire resistance, because that's a misnomer, but it gives it a high degree of fire tolerance, those big, mature bur oaks. We're also going to talk about uh, the subtle variability in trees. And a lot of that can be based on genetics, and it can be based on sight. So little sight differences and little genetic variability I've noticed that the bur oak in Iowa, uh, basically the acorn size, is much smaller than some of the acorns uh, we have for bur oak in central Illinois. And then in southern Illinois, some of the bur oak in the Kaskaskia River bottoms, I mean, they're the size of tennis balls. All right, they're that big. So there's a lot of genetic variability, and that carries over not only with the fruit, but also with the bark characteristics as well. Not so much the buds, but the bark and the fruit can have slight morphological differences. And then, uh, and then to confuse you even more, with some tree ID books, the authors will use different terminology. So again, it's just, I mean, that's one of the pitfalls with tree ID books is that you just have to find one that you can follow their lingo, okay? Color's a big one. We're going to talk about, you know, bark color. So we pretty much talked about uh, Provenance or location, I touched on the Iowa versus uh, Illinois differences, just slight different morphology differences with bark, and that carries over with fruit as well. Young versus mature, uh, everyone's probably seen this. Um, there's some species where it doesn't matter if it's a young tree or an old tree. How many can really identify American beech by a show of hands? You know, probably just by looking out in the woods, you know, whether that tree is 10 years old or that tree is 200 years old, you can probably identify American beech pretty, pretty easily. But if you have species such as uh, musclewood or blue beech or American hop horn beam, those are three common names for the same species, that species also looks like American beech. So you have to beware when species cross over um, as far as their geography is concerned. Growth rate, slow growing bark, fast growing bark, and sight and competition in the forest will also have an effect or impact on the way the bark looks. So again, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, sometimes it's complicated and it takes many years to be able to be really adept at tree ID based on bark alone. Genetics environment, we already talked on. So bark surface texture, we're gonna get to some photos, so don't worry, bear with me. I know there's a lot of, lot of type font right now, but we're gonna get to the photos. Again, this is that terminology that we have to grow accustomed to here. So ridges, when we talk about ridges, ridges are the vertical crests of, of the bark, and they're typically divided by these uh, valleys or furrows, okay? They're usually uninterrupted, as in northern red oak, by their bark. The ridges can be interlaced or in a diamond-shaped pattern, which we find a lot with our white ash and green ash, and also mockernut hickory. Very diamond pattern oriented with the ridges and the furrows. And we have examples of those, and I'll show you what those look like. And then the ridges can be broken, horizontal broken ridges. And a, and a great example of that is white oak. A lot of times white oak will have these broken horizontal bark patterns. But white oak is an anomaly too because it can have about four different bark textures. And they're all very, very different. So again, it's one of those mental things. You have to take a visual picture of it and put it back in your, your mind and part of your library. 
So furrows are basically those vertical grooves, that valley between the ridges in the bark. So it's really important that you understand the difference between ridges and furrows. Fissures, it's just a, a fancy name for these irregular cracks or crevices in a bark. And I'll show you a picture of a perfect fissure in a northern red oak. And we'll explain what that is. But usually the fissures are really, um, you can really see them on fast, young growing trees. And it's basically the bark is expanding as the tree is growing. So you get to see these fissures in the bark of a tree. All right, so finally we get some examples. So on the left is an example of kind of a, a furrow ridge for a mature eastern white pine, which is Pinus strobus. How are, is there anyone in the back? We have, we have some lights. We can kill some of the lights, Jesse, if you would. Thanks, Paul. So on the left, Pinus strobus. What's that? No, I know, I know, I can't help myself. And on the right is a very mature eastern cottonwood, Populus deltoides. So believe it or not, cottonwood at this maturity level, this is probably a 36 inch tree, has a high degree of fire tolerance. Again, not fire resistance, but fire tolerance. And that's kind of an oxymoron, right? Because you typically have eastern cottonwood in the floodplains and you don't have a lot of fire, but yet this tree has a relatively high degree of fire tolerance. Not as a juvenile, but as a more mature specimen. So here are those long ridges, and between the ridge is that furrow. So again, very important as far as for identifying trees out in the field, knowing those bark characteristics. Here's an example of uh, Quercus alba, or white oak. Here's an example of the horizontal broken ridge structure that it has. So it's not really deep furrowed or deep ridged, but a lot of times you'll get these little broken horizontal lines right here. Horizontal line, horizontal line. And that just breaks up that long ridge. And that's what this broken horizontal ridge is, is applicable to. So an example of, this is a more mature white oak. This is a very common bark appearance on mature white oak. Intersecting ridges, this diamond pattern that we frequently see in white ash and green ash, and on the right is mocker nut hickory. So we'll have this uh, diamond, this interlaced diamond pattern for mature uh, white ash and mature green ash. But you can also get a blocky bark pattern on mature white ash as well. So there's a little bit of genetic variability and site location with white ash. Sometimes you get a blocky bark appearance like persimmon. It actually will look like persimmon. And I have a slide of what a mature persimmon tree looks like. So sometimes it's, you know, you're not always going to be right when you just try to use bark for identification purposes. Again, it's part of your toolkit, right? It's part of your toolkit. Here's a chestnut oak, Quercus Montana. Again, just explaining this thick ridge, deep furrow system, and using the lens cap from their camera there just to show you that, you know, when you go out to the Appalachian region and you see chestnut oak, or up in Pennsylvania, and you see chestnut oak, I mean, basically this tree looks like cottonwood to me. That looks like cottonwood bark. So when I know that I'm in Pennsylvania or in Kentucky, and I see on the top of a mountain the tree that looks like cottonwood, no, that's actually chestnut oak. Here we have an excellent example of age-related variability. This is northern red oak, Quercus rubra. On the far left, you have a very juvenile stem. All right, that tree is anywhere from probably, you know, 10 to the 20 years of age. All right, it hasn't developed its strong ridge and furrow system. Okay, it really hasn't developed that yet. Then here you have about a tree that's 12 to 14 inches in diameter. So this tree, you know, is probably, you know, 40 to 50 years of age. And it's just slowly starting to see the ridge system develop and the furrow system in that age tree. And then this is more of a classic example of, you know, probably a 28 to 32 inch diameter northern red oak. Very distinguishable bark characteristics. And in dendrology class, back when I was an undergrad, we kind of learned it as a ski slope. If you've ever been out west, um, skied and whatnot, it kind of looks like the ski tracks or a ski slope on the side of a mountain. 
I'm not sure if you guys see that. I see that, but then again, that's what I learned. So anytime I see northern red oak bark, I try to explain that. And sometimes I get that glazed over look by the audience, which some of you are giving me right today. All right, fissures. This is a classic example of fissures. This also is a northern red oak tree. So basically, this is a very fast growing tree. And this orange pinkish area where the furrow is, basically you have the bark is separating. And that's called a fissure, and that's due to the fast growth rate of a tree. So when you see fissures in certain tree species, you know that it's growing relatively fast, all right? And you see this quite frequently on northern red oak. Not so much on black oak or the other uh, red oak family, but northern red oak, you see this all the time. And that's because northern red oak is a very fast growing tree. It is you know, one of the fastest growing red oaks, or uh, oaks in the, in the oak family. Bark surface texture, so we talked about furrows and ridges, but now we're gonna go into surface texture, smooth. You know, think about American beech, or musclewood, blue beech, American hophorn beam, American hophorn beam. Those have very smooth bark structures, or surface textures, I'm sorry. Uh, plates, some trees develop a more platy, kind of armor type appearance. And they're you know, circumscribed portions of bark. They're large and flat. They might be small uh, and blocky even. So when you think about plates, think about shag bark hickory and shell bark hickory. That's kind of a platy surface bark texture. All right? Everyone probably can identify a, shag, a mature shag bark hickory out in the timber, right? Yes, nod, there you go. So on the left is a smooth bark tree. It's a mature American beech. Fagus, grandifolia, and then on the right is American hornbeam. This is that tree that I've mentioned several times now. This, this particular tree has three common names. And so a lot of times I'll just refer to it as Carpus Carolinina. All right, so that's that musclewood, blue beech, or American hop hornbeam. Very smooth bark. Doesn't matter if it's just juvenile or immature. It always has this muscular Arnold Schwarzenegger look to it. I mean, it looks like a big arm, a very muscular arm, okay? On the left is a shag bark hickory, the platy bark surface texture. And on the right is its a good friend, the shell bark hickory. Shell bark hickory you typically find in bottomland floodplains and perched water tables. And shag bark hickory you almost always find on slopes or on upland sites. It doesn't like to get its feet wet, okay? We talked about the broken horizontal bark pattern for white oak. Well, here is a white oak that is displaying a different bark morphology. It's a more platy structure. And if any of you are into selling timber, this is what veneer buyers, this is what a lot of veneer buyers look for when they try to identify veneer grade white oak trees. They look for this platy bark texture. That's what they're looking for. That's what I've been told by a lot of veneer buyers. And side by side with another white oak that has a different bark surface texture. That's that broken horizontal pattern. Exact same tree, it's just different bark texture. So you can see why that sometimes it becomes quite difficult to ID trees just by bark and bark only. We have more bark surface texture. We have peeling or exfoliating bark. We have scales, and then we have flaking type bark. Here's some examples. This is what we learned in uh, dendrology school, or dendrology class as well, this burnt potato chip bark. And it sticks with me. You know, this was 20 some years ago, black cherry. And that's how our professor identified, or taught us to relate to black cherry bark. It looks like a bunch of burnt potato chips that have been glued to a tree. Black cherry, and it sticks with me. It does, and that's how I teach people how to identify black cherry. On the left is ironwood or eastern hop horn beam, so it has a more flaky bark texture. Appealing bark texture, think about river birch. Everyone's probably seen some river birch either as an ornamental specimen in your yard or if you're lucky enough to have it in, as part of its native distribution then you'll see a lot of river birch, and this is you know, a key morphological trait for river birch is to have this appealing, appealing bark characteristic. 
American sycamore has a, a very unique bark pattern, right? It's one of those trees where you can almost immediately identify out in the woods. Low on the stem, it has more of a flaky mottled appearance. And then as you migrate up the tree, what color does sycamore usually turn? Yeah, usually it's got a very strong white color to it. And does it have a thick or thin bark texture high up on the tree? It's really thin. I mean, just a real thin layer of bark protection there. So this flaky and mottled bark, uh, you know, a key indicator morphologically for American sycamore. Some species have these horizontal lines, but they're lenticels. And lenticels uh, basically allow for air exchange. And usually you find these lenticels on the twigs. And we'll show you some examples of lenticels on the twigs. And that really does. It helps us with ID, at least down to the species level. Shredding uh, fibrous bark. You know, think about eastern red cedar that typically has shredding or fibrous type bark. And then uh, corky type bark that can be on the bark itself or on uh, branches. On the left is a horizontal, these horizontal line buck on a ye or yellow birch. So that's an easy way to ID yellow birch, especially smaller diameter yellow birch out in the field. It has these horizontal lenticel type shapes um, stuck to the bark, okay? And then here's a classic blocky bark appearance, which is persimmon. And I know it's native to uh, southern Illinois, but you probably don't have persimmon native to Iowa nor Wisconsin. But uh, as an ornamental, you probably plant it. And a lot of people who are into hunting also plant persimmon trees for the fruit. And probably many of you have eaten persimmon, I'm sure, right? Just don't eat. You've got to make sure they're ripe. Because if you've ever eaten a persimmon that's not ripe, it sucks all the spit out of your mouth. <laughs> Believe me. My brothers, they tricked me once. Once. Corky bark, uh, think about hackberry. These wart-like projections on trees. And these wart-like projections become less discernible as the tree matures. But on young trees, young hackberry trees, these, uh, these warty, corky uh, projections are very prominent. And it's an excellent way to identify hackberry. Now, in southern Illinois, you get additional species, which is called sugarberry. And sugarberry and hackberry look virtually identical. And the way to separate them is, uh, for me, is to buy fruit. Because sugarberry uh, has more orangish fruit, where hackberry has more of a purple, uh, blackish, uh, black currant color to its fruit. Shredding, peeling bark, uh, eastern red cedar is kind of a perfect example of what that bark texture looks like. So twigs and buds, uh, real br you know, briefly, uh, we're going to talk about you know, terminal and lateral buds and axillary buds. Bud scale scars, what are they? What do they look like? Leaf scars are important for tree identification purposes. Uh, what a node is and an internode. Lenticels for air exchange and pith. All those things help us, assist us to identify trees down to the species level. So here's an example of a buckeye twig, Ohio buckeye. So right here we have the terminal bud. It's at the terminal end of the twig. The end of the twig has the terminal bud. Along the sides are lateral buds. They're on the side of a twig. So you have to know the difference between a terminal bud and a lateral bud. On most buds, not all buds, there are bud scales. Some buds are naked. They don't have any scales. So there's some terminology associated with describing how the buds look. Imbricate is one example. We'll talk about all these little terms. Lenticels on the side, that really helps us, especially with shell bark hickory and shag bark hickory. That's one way to help identify or differentiate those two species. The number, the prominency of lenticels and uh, shell bark hickory will almost have this little orange hint to it. Because in some areas of the US, you have shell bark hickory and shag bark hickory growing side by side. So you have to pick up on these little subtleties. And the, and the easiest way, to be quite honest, is the size of the fruit. Shell bark hickory, by another name, is also called king nut hickory. 
and it's and the nuts or the fruit of shellbark hickory are gigantic. Okay. These vascular bundle traces, so you have a leaf scar here, but these little dots, that's what vascular, those are called vascular bundle traces. And that's where you have the exchange of photosynthate and water and nutrient uptake, okay? That's the exchange between the twig and the leaf itself. So understanding and counting sometimes those vascular bundle traces will help you identify a tree down to the species level. Uh, terminal bud scale scars, so this is one year's growth right here where you get this folded area, that's a terminal bud scale scar, so you can measure the length of growth on that twig. So that's one year's worth of growth. Here's another year's worth of growth. So the distance between that is how much that twig was able to grow in one growing season. And that can be helpful sometimes for your yard trees. You know, does my yard tree need more fertilizer? Do I need to water it more? Well, you can look and to see the distance between these terminal uh, bud scale scars. You know, is it one inch? You know, one inch, that tree's not growing very much. Or is it 10 inches long? You know, that tree's you know, growing at a pretty good clip. And then we have these uh, lateral or axillary buds. So knowing what they look like. Uh, where they are positioned on a twig will help you with tree identification. So here we have some examples of uh, basically we have a, a butternut twig here. So we have a lateral, uh, basically we have a lateral bud and then we have a superimposed bud on top of that. But this just gives you an idea of what these leaf scars look like. Um, here's a catalpa, it has a world structure and then basically you have a, a, a maple over there. So we're going to talk about bud arrangement. There are a few bud arrangement is I want you to think about how they are positioned on a twig. So that's what arrangement means. How are they oriented on a twig is bud arrangement. And typically, uh, they come in three different flavors, and we'll talk about those three different flavors. We're also going to talk about position, size, shape, and color. Color is going to be very helpful for some species, not so much on, say, like oaks. All right, because a lot of the, the twigs and the buds, they look identical. All right, so for bud arrangement, you basically, you have one is alternate. Alternate's the most common bud arrangement on a twig. Opposite, meaning that on one side of the twig, you have a bud, and directly on the other side of the twig is another bud. So those buds are opposite of each other. They are not staggered. Staggered is an alternate. Okay? The great thing about opposite is it really, really helps you to the genus level because all ash trees, all maple trees, have an opposite bud arrangement. Very, very helpful. But there's a lot of alternate bud arrangement species, okay? But if you can see an opposite one, you're going to be able to whittle down to that genus real quick, okay? And then we have something called world, which means it's just like opposite, but you have three buds oriented across each other on the twig. And catalpa is a prime example of a world arrangement. And then we have something called sub-opposite. Who's familiar with buckthorn? How many people are very familiar with buckthorn? Buckthorn is classified as having a sub-opposite leaf arrangement. All right, so here we have some examples. On the far left is a bald cypress. So basically, you have a bud here, and you have to move up in a staggered pattern, and then you have a bud on the other side. So that is what we refer to as an alternate bud arrangement, or alternate, alternate leaf arrangement. Because where you have a bud, you're typically going to have either a flower or a leaf come from that bud. I mean, that's what buds produce. It's going to be either you know, a flower or a leaf or, you know, uh, on the side of a twig. At the, uh, at the terminal end, you're going to have more twig growth. Here we have an example of a sugar maple. So sugar maple, maples, all maples have an opposite bud arrangement. So on one side of the twig, you have a lateral bud. On the other side, you have another lateral bud, directly opposite. Here's an example of a world bud arrangement in catalpa. 
One bud, two buds, three buds, like a spoke around that twig. And then here's the classic example of, it's, it's sub-opposite because in some instances, these buds are just offset by, you know, millimeters, okay? Buckthorn is a classic example of a sub-opposite. So, in school, we learn these mnemonic devices on how to memorize or how to remember which species have this opposite leaf or bud arrangement. And this is the mnemonic device that I learned, at least this part, and then I've added this vibrant cat. That's mine. I copyright it, so don't use it, all right? So Mad Buck, all right? Everyone can probably remember that. Mad Buck, just remember that. Mnemonic device. The M start stands for maple. Everything in the maple family, Acer, the Acer genus, they all have an opposite bud arrangement. Ash, all of our native ashes, you know, black ash, white ash, blue ash, green ash, pumpkin ash, those are our five most common ashes here in the Midwest. They all have opposite bud arrangement. All dogwoods except for one. But it's aptly named. It's alternate leaf dogwood. Okay, it's the only dogwood that doesn't have opposite buds. But it's really easy to remember because it's called alternate leaf dogwood or pagoda dogwood. All buckeyes, including a uh, horse chestnut, have an opposite bud arrangement. And then uh, this vibrant cat is what I coined, and that's for the viburnums and catalpa. All right, so take a photo of that with uh, visually, whatever, and uh, remember that. Really help you with tree ID out in the woods. And then there are a couple more additional opposite woody plants. Um, the elderberries are opposite. Uh, bladder nut, there's a lot of bladder nut in the understory in Illinois for us. I'm not so sure up in Wisconsin or Iowa. And uh, button bush. Button bush is another uh, shrubby, small tree species that has an opposite bud arrangement. Bud position, terminal buds are at the tip, the extreme tip of a twig. It's real simple, terminal, the end. That's what it means. Lateral or axillary buds are almost always going to be on the side of a twig. Okay? And then uh, pseudo-terminal buds. This is a term that you're going to come across. And an excellent example of a pseudo-terminal bud, it's at the terminal end of the twig, but it's slightly offset. And the greatest example of that is basswood. And there's a lot of basswood up here. So basswood has these pseudo-terminal buds. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like. We have a couple more called superimposed buds. I'll show you what those look like and accessory buds. So because of this information, I'm going to burn through this real quick. But if you actually go, when Jesse puts this up on YouTube, you'll be able to you know, pause the slide presentation and be able to write down some of this information. So on the far left, uh, these are, this is a lateral bud for basswood. And here's a pseudo-terminal bud for basswood. So basically right here is where we have a, uh, a twig scar for, for basswood. So slightly offset is the pseudo-terminal bud. And that's a key way to identify basswood out in the field. Has very unique twig and uh, bud pattern. Here's an example of bitternut hickory. Bitternut hickory is probably the easiest hickory in the world to identify because it has these sulfur yellow buds. It is the only tree out in the forest that has these sulfur yellow buds. So it has a true terminal bud. And this is an example of a superimposed bud on top of a lateral bud. This is a leaf scar. And here's very common for, uh, for oaks. Almost all oaks have this very clustered uh, bud pattern at the terminal end, OK? Very indicative of oak, this clustered bud pattern at the terminal end of a twig. <laughs> Here's an example of a super superimposed bud. This is, uh, this is butternut. So we have this uh, larger bud superimposed on 
top of a lateral. Here's an example of the pith. So when we cut open a twig, we're able to look at the pattern of, of basically the pith. And I will show you a slide of butternut right next to walnut, and you'll be able to tell the difference just by looking at the pith, because butternut paradoxically has a darker pith color than black walnut. You'd think it'd be the other way around. Black walnut would be darker, but it's not. Here's another example of a uh, pseudo-terminal bud on catalpa. It's so basically you have this big leaf scar right next to the terminal bud. And then here's a same twig. On the other side, you have a twig scar. So that's a twig. Yeah. Front scales, nearly all species have bud. Um, some examples of a terminal bud, and on those buds, uh, there frequently are scales. Sometimes it's just a couple scales, sometimes there are many. So bud scales, you have imbricate. An example of imbricate would be uh, sugar maple. Uh, valvate, uh, bitternut hickory is an example of a valvate uh, bud scale, or yellow poplar or tulip poplar. Capped bud scales, indicative of sycamore. Sycamore has what we call bu capped bud scales. And then naked, um, witch hazel is a classic example of having no scales on the bud. Valvate, this is yellow poplar here. So this is what a valvate bud looks like. Here's an example of imbricate. So you have these bud scales. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, and then see how it's kind of, it's like shingles. Think of it like shingles. I mean, they're layered on top of the bud to protect it. And then here's a, uh, this is witch hazel, and it doesn't have any bud scales. It's naked. No bud scales that protect it. I really like this slide. I, uh, I borrowed this one. And uh, this, you have shell bark hickory on the far left. Here's bitternut hickory. This is pignut hickory. Mockernut hickory. Then shagbark hickory. So all the different hickories, there's subtle differences. And you can actually wind up keying them out just by looking at the buds. The one that stands out to me, obviously, is bitternut hickory, right? It's yellow. It's that sulfur mustard yellow color. Really easy to ID. Uh, I get this question quite frequently. How do you differentiate white ash from green ash? All right, they're separate species. They're in the same genus, but they're separate species. Well, the easiest way to key them out is just by the buds. They're actually, I'm sorry, they're leaf scar. Here's the leaf scar of a white ash. It has more of a crescent shape where that bud, that lateral bud, creeps down into that leaf scar. Where green ash, has more of a D shape, so it's more flat on top here, and then more of a D shape. It is D shape, all right? Just go with me here, all right? Disagree. It's just, yeah. And this is crescent shape. Just remember it, memorize it. And that's how you, it'll help you, believe me, it will. Okay? So that's the easiest way to differentiate those two species by looking at that leaf scar. There are other things, uh, there's small leaf-like appendages at the base of some plants. Those are called stipules, all right? But those stipules leave evidence of their existence on the twig, and we refer to those as stipular scars. So here you have yellow poplar or tulip poplar, and these little vegetative things are called stipules. Well, if you look right here, that is a stipular scar. And that can help you identify this tree down to the species level, just by picking up on those little things. It might seem like a lot in 50 minutes, but over 15, 16 weeks in school, you learn to pick up on these things real quick. Uh, how are we doing on time? What time did we, uh, what time did we start? What time's the next session? 10.45? Okay, we got, some, we got some time. We got some time. 
All right. So pith. So when the twigs or when the buds and the bark don't get you down to the species level, sometimes you're going to have to cut into those twigs. All right. You're going to have to look inside. You have to do some little destruct, some destruction, if you will, and see what kind of twig pith that tree has. All right. And there are several different uh, varieties or flavors of twig pith. One's conti uh, continuous or solid, and that's uh, an example of that's persimmon. Then you have something that's continuous and diaphragmed. Um, a classic example is black gum. And persimmon and black gum, the twigs are very similar in appearance, but once you cut into the twig, you'll easily be able to differentiate black gum from persimmon. That might not be a big deal up here, but in southern Illinois, where you get those two species growing right next to each other naturally in the forest, and especially if they're juvenile trees and they really haven't expressed their bark morphology yet, you'll have to cut into those trees. You'll have to cut into the twigs to be able to identify down to the species level. Chambered bark or chambered twig pith, uh, black walnut is a classic example of a chambered pith. Spongy, uh, this is elderberry. Elderberries have this spongy pith. And then we have this hollow excavated, uh, which is in, uh, this actually shouldn't be Diospyros virginiana. That should be uh, Lonicera or uh, honeysuckles. All honeysuckles, and you're probably quite familiar with bush honeysuckle. It has a very hollow or excavated pith. There isn't anything in there. You can cut it open and it's hollow inside. So this is what a continuous pith looks like. You cut it open and there's tissue all throughout. Here's what diaphragm looks like. It's solid, but it has these horizontal partitions. That helps you key down to the species level. And then this is what chambered is. So basically, it's hollow, and you have these, uh, these partitions. And that's a, this is a classic example of butternut and black walnut have this chambered or twig pith. So this is what diaphragm looks like. It's solid, but it has these partitions. This is yellow poplar. Here's black walnut. It's chambered and hollowed. And then here's a, here's a completely hollow pith, and this is bush honeysuckle. Butternut versus walnut. Butternut's on top. It's much darker, believe it or not, it is, than black walnut. So very similar, but butternut's going to be darker. Okay. As these trees mature, the bark, five minutes. Thank you, sir. So as these trees are younger in their juvenile state, it's, it's sometimes difficult for people to ID these trees down to the species level. But as they mature, the, bork, the bark morphology really comes to play, and you really don't have to rely on this twig pith for you know, getting down to the species level. Just one more slide. Butternut on top, black walnut on bottom. Bur oak has, uh, so some twigs have, you know, different growths. Here on bur oak, which is kind of classic, a lot of times you'll have these corky ridges, especially on juvenile trees. So juvenile trees, their twigs will have these, you know, corky growths growing on them. And that's an excellent way to identify some tree species down to the species level. Here's uh, some twigs are winged or angled. Here's an example of one of our native ashes, blue ash. So it has a very, and it's a, and a specific epithet is a quadrangulata, quad meaning four angled, and it's describing the four angledness of its twig. And then uh, twig appearance, surface, armament. Um, some species have spines, some have thorns, some have prickles. That really helps with ID. Everyone knows what honey locust looks like. Black locust. Um, so here we have uh, this is bl black locust. Here you have these stipular spines right around a leaf scar. Here's an example of hawthorn. Hawthorns, hawthorn. All right, have thorns as do honey locust. And then here's uh, here's a raspberry plant. Raspberries have prickles. And believe it or not, there's a difference between a prickle, a 
thorn and a spine. All right? Botanists get bored, so they just make up new words. And examples of uh, species that have armament, you know, honey locust, Osage orange, black locust, black locust devil's walking stick, uh, prickly ash. Those are all species that have some type of armament. And then uh, twig color, we're gonna, you know, some species, box elder, the newest growth of box elder is very green in color. Uh, red osier dogwood, red osier dogwood. What color are the twigs? They're red, all right? So the color of the twigs can really help you. But you need to look at the newest growth, all right? Because it's always in reference to the newest growth. Then you can also do, uh, you know, some twigs have odors or they have taste, sassafras, yellow birch, black cherries, a more pungent, almond bitter taste or flavor, spice bush, and anyone who's ever smelled a uh, common hop tree or wafer ash, wafer ash and hop tree are the same species, very pungent, all right? And then uh, we'll finish it up here. There's three field guides I want to introduce you to, and these are awesome. I mean, they're very, very affordable, and these are excellent field guides. So a key to Missouri trees in winter, it's $3. Order this field guide. It is outstanding. And a lot of the species, I know it's Missouri, but they're going to have almost all the species that Iowa and Wisconsin and Illinois has, okay? $3, you can't beat the price. Buy, buy a couple. You know, put it in your field backpack. Keep one in your car. Keep one on your bookshelf. Outstanding publication, all right? Fruit Key and Twig Guide to Trees and Shrubs. Uh, this is William Harlow. It's a brand, It's been around forever. Every dendrology or every student who's taken dendrology in college had to purchase this. I did. I still have mine. It's awesome. It's seven dollars. Buy it. It's worth the money. Buy it. Buy several. And then, of course, this is a pretty good one. I, I think I, I know the guy who did this one. Uh, I'm the editor, not the original author. Yeah, put that in there. But for ten dollars, this is a pretty darn good guide. And if you send it to me, I'll sign it. All right, so that's it. I'll entertain a couple questions. I'm sorry that ran over, and I'm sorry for some of the uh, little technology glitches. I'll take two questions real quick. Two questions. They'll put you on the spot. Yes, sir. Like, uh, yes, I can identify everything. No, go ahead. Fertile size to maybe paddle size, uh, distinguishing black, uh, black cherry from higher wood. Black cherry from higher wood. Black cherry from higher wood just by looking at? The bark. By the bark? Yeah, for me, I mean, they're, they're totally different. But are you talking about juvenile black cherry and a juvenile? That big, that, that big around? So sometimes what you do, instead of the bark, go for a bud. Look, go for the bud difference instead. Or at that size, Snap, snap open a twig and smell. The black cherry has this bitter almond pungency to it. And black cherry is a really easy one just by smelling a broken twig. It has that bitter almond smell that's unmistakable. It's pretty hard. Like I've been cutting thousands of them, also I'll see one with that smut on it that only black cherry gets. Yeah, right. It, it, yeah, that's black knot. That's a black knot fungus that black cherry gets. Black cherry. Yeah, I mean, get rid of the birds and you won't have any more black cherry. And of course, I'm going to be around all day. I got a lot of jokes. Actually, no jokes. But I'll be around all day. If you have any questions, feel free to corner me, okay? Thanks again. Appreciate it.